Hello and welcome to the Saints FC podcast. Uh, this week I'm lucky enough to catch up with Mr. Jeremy Wilson, the Deputy Football Correspondent for the Daily Telegraph. Um, Jeremy is probably a journalist that you would have read um, his stories for if you're interested in football, uh, but particularly if you're interested in the Saints. Uh, you may notice that he seems to get the Southampton scoops before most of the major newspapers journalists. Um, and that's maybe due to his links and uh, his time that he spent uh, with the Daily Echo covering the the, the club um, back in the, the 90s and in the early noughties as well. Jeremy does write about all sorts of football covering, you know, European, international and domestic football. But you will always notice that he does spend a little bit more time on, on the Saints in his Daily Telegraph uh, episodes. Um, he absolutely seems to really enjoy talking about the Saints as well. We get into a few questions and get to reminisce a, a little bit about uh, some of the Saints teams that he's watched over the years. Um, we also get to speak about... Uh, Jeremy's award-winning uh, piece of journalism on Alzheimer's. Um, Jeremy was, you know, he, he quite rightly won the Football Writer of the Year from the Alzheimer's uh, Society or the Journalist of the Year from the Alzheimer's Society uh, for his story linking Alzheimer's to football. And that's, that's really interesting. We get into that um, towards the end of the podcast. Um, as always, please do let us know what you think of the podcast. Uh, you can email us, saintsfcpodcast at gmail.com or you can find us on Twitter at Saints FC Podcast. And if you catch up with this on YouTube as well, uh, you can leave us a little comment. Um, of course, now we did mention our little arrangement with Beer 52 uh, last week, and quite a few of you have been getting in contact with me uh, to say thanks for the beer. Um, if you're hearing this and thinking, what, what, what's going on here? The Saints FC podcast are giving out free beer. If you didn't listen to last week's episode, um, we've got a great little offer from Beer52. Um, and as a way to say thanks for listening to the Saints FC podcast, we have organized a free case of craft beer for every Saints FC podcast listener. All you have to do is pay the postage on that, which is £5.95. Um, so just to let you know about what Beer52 are, they're a monthly craft beer discovery club searching out incredible and exclusive small batch craft beers from the world's greatest brewers and bring them back to their members um you know from light and hoppy ipas to dark porters and stouts um you, you can basically choose what variety of beers um that you like and then uh beer 52 kind of i, I suppose kind of curate a little box of beers uh, for your taste um, there's absolutely no minimum commitment to the club. And if the club is not for you, you can, of course, pause and cancel it at any time. And uh, Beer52 pride themselves on their five-star rated customer service. Um, so you shouldn't have any difficulties there if you suddenly decide that you know a, a beer subscription is not the right thing for you. Uh, but either way, whether you think you're going to be in for the long run or, or for the short haul, you could get yourself a free box of beer courtesy of the Saints FC podcast. The way to do that is you need to go and visit www.beer52.com forward slash saints. www.beer, spelled B-E-E-R, numbers five and two, dot com forward slash saints. And then you can get your free case uh, courtesy of the Saints FC podcast. Anyway, Enough about beer, as if we could ever talk about, uh, enough about beer. And on to the football and my conversation with Jeremy Wilson, uh, Deputy Football Correspondent at the Daily Telegraph. OK, ladies and gentlemen, I am delighted to have on the phone with me today uh, Jeremy Wilson. Um, Saints fans, probably you'll probably know Jeremy or recognise his name. He, he used to write for the Daily Echo and the Sports Pink. He's currently the Deputy Football Correspondent uh, for the Daily Telegraph and um, last year won the National Journalist of the Year Award from the Alzheimer's Society um, on the Dementia Friendly Award. So we, we might get a chance to speak about that later. Um, Jeremy, welcome to the show. Uh, just just to start off, you know, how did you get into journalism and, and how did you end up reporting on the Saints? Yeah, I um, well, I sort of left. I, I was at college and then I, I did went to university and I wasn't too sure what I was going to do. And I did work experience at different places and I was doing some sort of temping jobs as well. And uh, luckily, one of the work experience at the Salisbury Journal, a weekly newspaper, 
they they offered me a sort of trainee position. So you, you kind of did your training on, on the job. And I did that for a couple of years. Um, and after that, I then got a chance to just move to the Southampton Echo, uh, which was owned there, still owned by the same the same organisation. So you sort of move, move, can kind of move internally between some of those regional papers and uh, just started on the sports desk there. And it was a time when, I mean, Graham Hiley and John May, who some of your listeners will probably be familiar with, they've, they've been the sort of saints men, particularly Graham, for a good good deal of time. And they, they've just both just moved on. So it was a sort of, there was a sort of bit of an opportunity there, which was just coincidental, really. And um, Adam Leach was there as well. And we both sort of started really taking taking that up. And obviously, Adam's still there doing a great job on Saints. And um, we worked together for three years. It was between 2002 and 2005. Um, do, doing Saints for the Echo, which was it was great. I mean, it was the first I'd covered like the Salisbury Salisbury City for the Salisbury Journal, so that was quite fun grounding because you it was so you went on the team bus and it was you know very much local football, um, and you had that that degree of access. And obviously, then covering Saints was a different a different world really to to that their Premier League team at the time. Gordon Strachan was the manager. He was quite a interesting character to deal with for the um, for the media. Rupert Lowe was the chairman, and we used to have quite a few run-ins with with him. Um, I mean, I liked I liked Gordon Strachan a lot. Actually, he was a very genuine person. But it was quite a it was quite a rude awakening, really, because those two actually, Rupert and uh, Gordon, were two of the probably two of the toughest people that yeah, that I've that I've dealt with actually and I mean that's and that's over sort of nearly 20 odd years now um, and, and I cover a lot of Arsenal and a lot of Chelsea now and I've sort of obviously covered covered all, all England and all the all the sort of biggest clubs at, at different points and um, and actually those you know that in terms of sort of journalist relationship with uh, with, with figures at a club that was probably the most combative I've, I've ever had to to deal with you know which was it was good in a way because if they were unhappy with something it wasn't a case of nowadays you know especially at the sort of probably at the, the, the sort of top the, the the bigger clubs there are so many layers of um staff working there that you kind of get a message through sort of two different people if you if if, if there's an issue with something you've written or they want to tell you there's a problem and they're not happy about something whereas that Gordon Strachan would just literally ring you up and and could shout at you and, and Rupert Lowe was the same really but why not shout it he wasn't quite as sort of from the culture of football where if you weren't asking, you know the store training ground effing and blinding type type sort of person but it certainly let you know quite um quite directly if there was a problem so it was, it was a really really good experience to do that and um it was an interesting time for the club because obviously it was the season they finished i think it was eighth and reached the fa cup final it might have been tenth my no, memory it, 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 uh, was it was eight, it was a yeah. top half finish yeah i remember it was a good it was a really good season and i thought gordon strachan actually did it he sometimes gets a bit I, with that group of players because i think the, the squad in the last sort of four or five years is just another level in terms of quality i think that squad then was pretty it was a pretty you know, without being disrespectful to the figures there it wasn't it was a fairly there wasn't there wasn't many sort of players there that were going to really lift lift you that far out of your seat really. I mean, a really good good group of players. I thought we got an uh, amazing amount out of them. If you go through that team, the sort of BTS and Oakleys and Wilmerod, uh, Delap, Swenson, you can get, just go the Telfer, go right through it. I don't nearly every single one of those players, Wayne Bridge, Marsden, they had their best couple of years of their whole career was then. And I yeah. think that, and, and I think if that happens, if you get a whole squad that are pretty much having their best couple of years of their career at the same time, that tells you that the manager was doing a very, very good job. And I think he did a really good job. And it, and it obviously slipped after Strachan went, and then it went into the whole Paul Sturrock, um, Harry Redknapp, Clive Woodward, and all of that. And I, I sort of was on the the back end of that. So that was that was really interesting in a different way. It was obviously a harder time for the club, but. It was it was a you know it was a it was a soap opera really and and, and with the with the characters you had the sort of you know Rupert Lowe, Clive Woodward, Harry Redknapp, Simon Clifford, the guy the coach that Clive Woodward brought in. You had Dennis Wise was there for a bit, Dave Bassett. You know it was yeah. really it was really from a journalistic point of view it was sort of golden away because you just had so many 
you know, there was obviously a degree of tension and conflict, but you just had lots of interesting, quite big characters in a football club, and you did, don't always don't always get that. And uh, so, I mean, it wasn't you know, it obviously didn't turn out great in terms of where the club went at that time and and after that, but it was it was interesting interesting period to cover. Yeah, and um, I know after you finished writing, uh, writing for the Daily Echo, you um, published a book on Southampton as well. Um, yeah, I, I, I've, I don't think it's in print, but I have noticed you can get second-hand copies on, on Amazon. <laughs> um, I was wondering, is your interest in Southampton purely professional, or is there a part of you that's that's a fan of Saints? As no, well? I'm a Southampton fan. No, I'm a Southampton fan. I grew yeah. up in Hampshire, so um, no, no, I used to. Um, I was. I remember when I was at school. I wasn't like a season ticket holder, but I would go. I would go with my mates like um, pretty regularly. It was like in the in this sort of late eighties, early not early mid nineties, really. Um, so yeah, it was the. I mean, the first game. I mean, I remember getting taken very early on when I was sort of must have been like seven or eight when it was the the very good Laurie McMenemy team of sort of. Um, you know the uh, the sort of mid, uh, early mid eighties team, um, the sort of Danny Wallace and all, all of those lots. So when when uh, Nick Holmes and I remember that you know David Armstrong. But really, when I was sort of going off on my own two feet, it was the kind of Letizia era and and sort of the back end of Ian Bramford and then going into sort of Alan Ball and the sort of slightly better times. But yeah, I remember. We used to go in the Milton, Milton, and for under 16s, it used to be two pounds. You could just turn up, and so it makes me sound very old when you hear hear that. To, to think that's so that's what it was. It was two pound in the Milton for under 16s when we used to, when we were at school when we used to go. But it was it was that it was that era. I remember that I had a very fun team with like Ruddock, Herlock, um, quite a sort of quite a dirty, quite an aggressive team. Glenn Cockrell. Uh, Benali was the, the sort of left back that oh, that that team sticks in my my memory a little bit because um, and then you sort of had Letizia who was kind of like the antithesis of all of that but you had a very quite a physical team um, when I first went as I say I can't, I sort of got taken occasionally um, you know with my with my dad when when it was the sort of back end of the kind of golden Menemy era and then when I as I say when I started going with my mates it was more that Bramford and there was a bit of and you know, the, at the time, the, the crowd were quite restless, and it was that it was that very physical. I remember Ter- Terry Herlock. I always remember for some reason he was quite. A, and, and obviously, he had Letizia Shearer was just just a, just starting, and just yeah. sort of he obviously didn't didn't stay long. So yeah, yeah. So yeah, I do. I, I, you know, as I say, I wasn't I wasn't the degree of being a kind of never miss a game season ticket holder but i would certainly go a fair bit every every season and, and what's your favorite saints team then from the years that you've been watching and covering football um cool that's a good a good question i suppose you always like like the one that you you came in with so i suppose that that one that i described before and and the sort of litizia period of when i suppose particularly when alan ball was 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 managed manager was very memorable um and then I, I guess because because i was covering them the that that fa cup team I, I was was i just thought was i just thought i think when you look back at that team as i said i think they got, they got a huge amount out of them and i do i do actually think i mean I suppose doing that book as well you kind of gives you a bit of perspective over the sweep of history and actually, you know, for all the frustrations that I understand people probably have over the last year or so, where it's sort of progress has stalled a bit, actually the last five years have been terrific, you know, as, as good as you know, it, it stands comparison with any other period, probably just the, the McMenemy early 80s, basically. But if you go back through it, I think it's pretty hard to find. I don't think there's any other, apart from the early 80s, I don't think there is, I'm pretty certain that there's not a single other period in the club's history where they've been, con- where we've been consistent in the top half of uh, the top flight. So, you know, it's easy, it's easy as a fan, you know, you get, you get upset with the manager and whatever, and I understand that, and the owners, we all sort of feel that a little bit because people are worried about relegation and all the rest of it, but actually it's been a, it's been an incredibly successful period the last few years. 
Yeah, and, and that leads me kind of very well onto my next question, really. It's like after, I mean, you said we've got five years of being consistently performing well in the Premier League and, and the two years before that were fantastic with the back-to-back promotions. You know, after such a long stretch of doing so well, what, what do you think the reason is that Saints are struggling now? Well, I think the biggest reason is obviously that the better you do, the harder it is to keep progressing. I mean, it's, it, when when you're at the bottom of League One, there's a lot, there's a, the room for progression is a, a, a huge amount bigger than if you're eighth or seventh or ninth or tenth in the in the Premier League. You can only go up six or seven places, and then and then you've got six clubs that really financially and and in terms of what they've done in the last. 10 years say six clubs kind of stand apart from the the rest of the Premier League obviously um, there there are odd seasons where that can get that can get sort of upset because one of those clubs might have a, a particularly bad season or or, uh, or a Leicester or even like Saints look like they could be a club that might do something like that I thought a few years ago maybe the year after Pochettino around the first year of Cuban but um, you, you, you you've got clubs that have got a little shot at getting in, in amongst that. But basically, I think the biggest reason is just it's, it is what it is. You, it's very, very hard to, you can't, I mean, it's like Bournemouth have done incredibly well. Um, and now they've stalled really, but you can't really say Eddie Howe's doing a bad job. He's, 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 it's, and if you get to a certain point in, in your progress, you, you, the, 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 the possibility to, continue improving year on year you, you suddenly have to be beating the teams in the top six which is a bit different than sort of making your way up through the football league so I think that's the first reason I suppose the second one is I think they did they obviously I think the club did a brilliant job with their recruitment particularly after that that the, the sort of first summer after Nicola Cortese left and um, there was that the first sort of exodus the sort of Lalana and and all of those they did a particularly good job of obviously after that you know you give them 10 out of 10 for that I suppose since the the years since then it's a bit it's it's been less um, effective, but it's still. I, I, I would. I sort of hesitate to be to be too critical because I think it's. I think what they're trying to do is a hard balancing act. I don't think it's hard to. I, I don't think you'd be a genius to do what they did every single time with with the the, the money that came in with, of that first summer after um after Nicola Cortese went and to, to sell that number of players and then buy the players that they did that summer and and get a better team, which which it was really under Koeman for a year or two. To, to be able to keep doing that every single time is, I think, is nigh on impossible. So I don't, I don't think their recruitment's been, it, I just don't think it's been quite as good as it was. And, and I think that's probably almost impossible to keep doing that, really. I think there's, yeah. there's probably a big degree of luck in that. And I suppose, you know, at some point, the fact that, you know, the investment, isn't it, it? It does seem that the that what gets sold sort of pretty much gets reinvested, but maybe maybe it doesn't always appear that everything does because because some of it gets eaten up into wages. But there's obviously not there's obviously not the injection of extra money that there was in the early years of the Liebherr ownership. Yeah. That the sort of the, there wasn't money, there wasn't loans coming in and money there wasn't extra money to what the club was naturally generating and they obviously clawed some of that back and there isn't there isn't that 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 sort of injection of money year on year that there there obviously was in the first period of, of, of that. And that's you know, a lot of clubs have to, to cope with that. And um you know, I, you know I'm I'm a, as, as I said, I think when you when you look at what what they've done in the last sort of five, ten years, the the people running the club, um, it's obviously changed a little bit here and there, and and there's that uncertainty now over the change of ownership, and what what that will mean in the longer term. I think you've got to, you, you, I think it's hard to be anything other than give them quite a lot of credit. We can we can we can then we can look now and and pick pick holes in sort of individual parts of, of recruitment and individual decisions which I think you can do at any club really but I think to get Saints finishing consistently in the top half now I think it's almost inevitable that you're going to have period, have some seasons where it's where it's a bit dicey and a bit difficult and it, I, I, I'm not saying that that's not caused by mistakes obviously it's caused by mistakes and 
whether it was right to change manager and whether it was the right manager to come in. But I just think in the business you're in, the sort of how volatile that is, how many decisions you're making, how competitive competitive it is, how many other clubs have got got big budgets. I think it's almost inevitable you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna have seasons that are more rocky than than others. You know, I, just, I don't think there's any club that can avoid that really. So I, now I still have quite a, a reasonable amount of sort of faith. Every club really below ninth, I think, or tenth. It's it's a it's a bit of a worrying worrying time because it's just so 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 tight down there. But yeah, I think I think it was impossible to keep progressing in the way that that they had without a huge injection of money. And I suppose at the same time, the the Lieber family were, were no longer going to be sort of giving loans or, or or putting in any of their own money, and and that 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 was a change, which is nobody's fault really. It's just that's just what happened. Um, and you know, they'd probably not hit the jackpot quite in the way that they did that first time in recruitment. But as I say, I don't think the recruitment's been. You know, there's, there's you can go through it, and there's obviously things, ones that have not worked, and ones that have worked. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think it's just a combination of all of that, really. I think it was. I think it would be remarkable, given what what funds there are, that it would would just keep getting better every year. I just don't. I just don't think that's that's feasible, really. Yeah. Okay, well, um, I, I don't know if you if you've got another five minutes, but perhaps um, I think it would be yeah, really yeah, interesting for our for our listeners to hear about uh, the story that you put out on football and Alzheimer's that that you won the National Journalist of the Year award um, from the Alzheimer's Society for because I think Alzheimer's is probably something which affects every family in the land and and something of interest probably to a lot of our listeners. Yeah, it does. I mean, yeah, and it was the same for me. Obviously, not it was sort of grand, grandmother's side of it. But I mean, that wasn't the particular reason why I became interested in the subject, although I suppose I, I could understand the impact of, of, of that disease that it can have on, on, on the family and how, just how difficult it is to 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 sort of deal with. But I, I suppose the story really just came through um, speaking to the Astle family, who, who's, who's uh, Jeff Astle, the former England player, died um in the early 2000s 2002 uh and he, he developed alzheimer's at a very early age in, in his 50s and uh football a, a coroner then ruled that it, it, it that it was because of um he, he said heading the ball whether it's the whether it's heading the ball or whether it's just the collisions and the sort of elbows and um, concussions that would have happened through his career, but it was it was due to some amount of brain damage from playing football, and I, and I suppose what after speaking to his family, what became apparent was, and then the, we looked at different teams from that, that those eras, and it was pretty. I mean, first first of all, it was it was quite alarming to see how many players were were struggling basically and and uh, not obviously uh, it's it's difficult because people will say to you oh well but people who don't play football get alzheimer's and and of course they do and there's lots of different reasons but what was interesting about football and worrying was that there just seemed to be a disproportionate number of people getting it at a very early age you know in their 50s in their 60s and when you looked at the national statistics it tended it's obviously a very um common disease but it tends to it tends to hit people more in their sort of eighties and their nineties. It's pretty rare to have high numbers of people getting in their sixties, fifties, sixties. It obviously does happen that way. And what I, what I couldn't believe when I said that, so I said, oh, well, so what's the what's the um, you know how what's the percentage of footballers that get it against the percentage of the population that have it at that age? I thought that'd be quite easy to done, and I just presume that would have been done and it, and it never and, and for some reason the football authorities had always kind of made reasons and oh well, it's difficult it's hard to do that it's hard to get the data so it, was, it wasn't a, it wasn't a sort of scientific test that needed to be done of what's going on in someone's side someone's brain it was just actually quite a simple statistical thing of right let's have a look at 2000 former footballers and find out how many people are struggling with something and then let's compare that to the same age um, group in, in the national population and see if there's something going on is you know are you more likely to have, have got it and, and the fact that nobody had done that research and these and the, these families have been asking for it for sort of 15 plus years struck me as very strange really and um, perhaps not so and strange then the more, that, yeah. 
FA are having no. a dereliction of duty, you know. No, and I think that what happened, and they promised they're going to do it, and they didn't do it, and then and and basically it became a bit of, and then I think the 1966 group, it became very clear that I think that brought it into the sort of consciousness that bit more because um, of the outfield team that are still alive. Obviously, sadly, Alan Ball and Bobby Moore had had already died, but. Of the, the eight eight outfield players, four of them now are suffering with either memory loss or dementia. And most out of those, I think uh, I'd need to double check, but I'm pretty sure it came on in in their 60s. So again, you're kind of and then Dawn Astor, who's the daughter of Jeff Astor, was able to sort of produce whole teams from the from that era uh, um, where where sort of 50% were, were struggling now you would expect it you know it was just it was just completely different to what you'd expect the the proportion to be so um so and then you go and meet the families and and you know they're absolutely convinced that there is some kind of link and uh, the other the other thing that obviously happened as well was the american in american it's become a huge issue with the concussion film um, and it's resulted in huge payouts, and, and it's, it's the link has been scientifically proven that this that it that it's caused. There's, there's basically a different, there's a strain of dementia or a type of dementia um, called CTE, which is it's you know it's basically caused by brain trauma. So um, we any, anyway after we did a lot of coverage on it, went to see lots of families who've been affected. Um, the FA have now said they're going to do research into it, and it's been commissioned, and it's it's actually begun. It began in January, so we'll you know in two or three years' time we'll we'll get a, a much sort of fuller picture of of really you know whether football is is suffering, and then obviously if they find that football is footballers are suffering um, worse than than the rest of the population, and that football really is a, you know you are at greater risk of developing these conditions if you played football. Um, then they might, you know, there, there's an argument that you would look at how you sort of mitigate the risks, especially for children, really. So that, that, that's probably the next step, really. I think the first, the first step is to find out is there a problem, is there something happening, and then after that to to sort of look at what how, how you can um, how you can sort of reduce that risk. I don't think any I've never met, and and a lot of people sort of will, will go, oh well, the people just want to ban heading or ban. I've not met a single family, a single ex player, a single person that's campaigned on this that wants to do that. They just want to find out what's happening, and then. If there is a bit of a risk, then maybe you could, and, it, and it's found that it's worse if someone's at a young age, then you can just look at different ways of changing the way um, we coach and the way the way football's structured that would just mitigate that risk. I mean, if there's if there is a correlation, surely the first thing you'd do is you wouldn't you wouldn't sort of encourage children to be sort of heading a ball a lot in training, and you, you would just reduce the amount of of um, of, of sort of collisions and contact that the, 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 the head had um, in in football. So I, I think it's a sort of we either put our head in the sand and ignore the problem, or we all, we're, we're you know if we if we confront it, it means we're going to sort of ruin football or ban football. I think it's about being intelligent about it, finding out what's happening, and then if there is a problem, looking at how we can how we can um, mitigate that risk because obviously football has loads of brilliant health benefits as well and, and I don't think anyone wants to sort of wants to 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 sort of turn away from that in, in any way. Uh, absolutely. Um, Jeremy thank you very very much for your time. Um, I'm sure our listeners would have thoroughly enjoyed that. Um, I, I think you could talk about Southampton for a lot longer so I might have to ask you to come back at some point. But, <laughs> yeah. No problem. Been a real pleasure. Thanks Jeremy. All right. No, thanks for having me.